Hi, I am here today with Diane Phillips of DK Designs. She is located in Pelican Island, on Pelican Island in New Jersey. She and I met in California um, in the San Francisco Bay Area probably about 12, 13 years ago now. Um, and we just coincidentally happened to both be back on the East Coast. Uh, but I wanted to take this opportunity to talk with you, Diane, and share your story with our group. So can you please tell me a little bit about how you got into this business? Thank you, Natalie, for having me. Um, so I started DK Designs back in 2001, um, officially like on the books of 2003. Um, I have a business, um, an MBA marketing background, and I was doing high tech marketing. And I've always had an um, an interest in the arts and so um, but not necessarily painting or drawing and so um, about gosh, 2000 I used to go visit my family in Hawaii and uh, you know they wear the hair flowers in their hair and so I looked on the internet and found a school in Hawaii and at that time I was in the process of relocating to Hawaii and buying a house my first house there and so um, I contacted the school and was taking classes just when I was telecommuting back and forth. And so um, they offered a program where you could um, basically take classes to learn to teach um, the art. And so I thought it was a really neat concept because um, even though like before I would do like um, rubber stamp cards and stuff, it was always somebody else's design and you're only just using their stamps to create something and embellish it. So this I felt was like, wow, I could teach, um, I could create my own um, flowers out of clay um, and sell them. So I saw the business potential there. Um, and initially, like I'm an introvert, um, and so I wasn't really keen on teaching, but it was kind of a means to an end. And so um, a lot of it was just, you know, you try to work through it, and you know, if you're not comfortable with talking in front of people. Um, it's a little challenging, but you know, you just with the experience and time, you just learn how to deal with people and encourage them. And, and so now I love teaching. Um, I actually find it um, enjoyable. Um, I really like the people that I uh, that come to take classes with me, and that's just happened probably over the last three to four years that I really have come to enjoy it. And so what it is is um, I should kind of step back. So. Um, I teach with Deco Clay Craft Academy. They're based um, originally in Japan. And then um, the head instructor, uh, Kazuko Miyai's daughter, um, Yukiko, um, brought it to Hawaii. And so that's where I learned the whole um, clay art form. And so her and her mother have like created this amazing school and it's just using air drive polymer clay um, to create everything from flowers to sculptures to figurines. And so, um, it's a really great um, community of people. Um, you know, it's obviously it's an investment and it's like a hobby to most people, but um, it's the one thing I find that, you know, you could turn it into a business if you choose to, and if you see the business potential there, then um, it's a great concept. And so we believe in hands-on um, classes. No, we don't do any online um, tutorials or things. You can find certain things on YouTube, you know, and, but they're very short. And, very simple, um, but our philosophy is is to do hands-on classes with people, and um, so it's been a great um, opportunity for me. Um, back in 2008, I was featured on the Martha Stewart show, and so that kind of really catapulted my kind of business with Deco Clay, and uh, you know I was getting orders and I wasn't prepared at all. <laughs> um, but like you know, people were contacting me left and right, like, "Can I buy this? Can I buy that?" And I didn't. All my pieces were at um, the show and I was like can you wait like a couple weeks because <laughs> everything I have is there and then um, but I was getting more and more interest in the classes and that really um, you know helps my business a lot um, so it's kind of gone up you know you have your ups and downs with the business with the economy but I really enjoy um, you know whoever wants to come and learn um, I enjoy sharing it with them I, and I really focus now like it's not a competition you know, I used to think that way, like, because people would, like, ask you questions, because they want to know everything, right, right away, and at first, I was very gun-shy about it, I was like, well, I did all the work, so 
you know, why am I just going to give it to you? But now I feel like, you know, if you're going to encourage somebody and you want them to do well at this and you want the business to grow, you have to be open to just encouraging them and, you know, sharing it. And, you know, so that's kind of where, um, you know, my headspace is in terms of my business now. It's like I don't find, you know, my students as a competition. Um, I, you know, try to encourage them if they want to do it as well, then you know, I'm happy to help them. I'm curious about the relationship between your business and the school. I know that you continue having close ties with the school. Is it a franchise of sorts? Can you break away from the school if you chose to do that? So it's, um, we do sign contracts, you know, when you become an instructor. So they have very specific rules and it's easy to follow. You know, you, there's, um, because it's, um, developed in Japan, they have their um, structure, and so we pretty much follow it um, for the most part. So, like once you you pay into it, you know, like you have membership fees, and then when you um, pass a curriculum, you pay um, an examination fee or like a certification fee. So you get a certificate. It allows you to go on. It allows you to get more discounts, um, and so it's a gradual process um, and it's also to protect the intellectual property of definitely craft academy because her and her mother have spent years and years almost 40 years now um, developing this beautiful art form and so um, each of us you know like if you're an instructor you basically you know the costs are on you like however you develop your business um, the academy helps you in terms of they publish on their website that, you know, you're a certified instructor. If they get anybody that's asking, like, oh, I live in such and such area, does anybody give accelerated classes or, you know, I'd love to learn who's the closest instructor. So they'll refer those people on to, um, you know, the instructor in that area. Um, and then, um, you know, you also get to then go on to learn the um, advanced courses. So there's a lot more than just, you know, a beginner's course. Um, and so instructors um, get uh, the privilege of going on to learn more advanced things. So, um, yeah. So it's not really a franchise per se, like in terms of like you're investing $10,000 and you know, just mm -hmm. for the name. Um, I guess in a small way maybe you might consider it as a franchise but not like in my typical you know like what I think of a mm -hmm. you know a big franchise business. Sure. So could you break off on your own or no because of the proprietary uh, information? Um, I actually had the experience of doing that um, like you know I think in this business you know and like kind of like the entrepreneurial you think oh I can do this on my own like I don't need them and and so that happened to me. I got, you know, a really big ego and people were asking me. And so, you know, I chose like to teach cake artists on the, you know, um, and I was teaching them more than what typically um, the academy allows for. And so I did that, you know, but they knew that this was my uh, lifeblood, like this is what I was doing full time. So they gave me the discounts that, you know, I've been um, privileged to have um, even when I was teaching. And so I basically just did finished products after that. And it was at a time in my life where it was just so much like, you know, as an entrepreneur and not having in any employees, you know, you're a one, one woman show. So it's like, you know, you do all the business stuff, you do the accounting, you know, it's, it's a lot. And then when you're trying to balance family and everything else, it, it gets to be a bit much. And so you know, after the Martha Stewart show and all that, like I was like, you know, I just wanted to take a step back, focus on a little bit more on just finished products and the creative aspect of it. But um, back in 2015, I was in Hawaii uh, for a family um, uh, memorial service. And I kind of had this, I don't know, epiphany or whatever, but I felt like I needed to bury the hatchet with them. Mm -hmm. Like just, you know, I said a lot of things um, that, you know, I felt, really horrible for and you know it just didn't go the way I had hoped and not with the expectation of like I wanted to go back to teach for the academy it was more just like just clean the air and um, feel better about you know what I did and you know like just to make amends and so I went in it was like the day I was flying home back to uh, California and I just went in and you know it was very emotional but like um, 
Yukiko is a very just giving person. She's and forgiving. Um, you know, and she just said, she's like, the door is always open. Whenever you want to come back, if you're willing to follow the rules, like, you know, we'll allow you to come back. And I was not expecting it at all. And so I was like, you know, I had to think about it a lot. Like, do I really want to do this? You know, and, um, and so I talked it over with my husband and, you know, he's like, well, you know, it's another revenue stream that you wouldn't otherwise have if you just stayed on your own. And I did miss classes like I miss learning and that's the thing is like when I broke off like I wasn't you know if I was learning it was like I'm figuring things out on my own on how to create certain flowers or whatever but um it's always nice to you know continue that education regardless of whether you know like it's on your own or you know through the academy but um I really appreciated the opportunity and so I chose to come back and, and teach with the school and and it's really become, you know, I think they're focusing more on supporting the instructors and really creating a community and a team effort. And, um, you know, they've gone through their challenges as well. It grows really well in like Russia and um, Asia. Mm -hmm. But for some reason in the U.S. It's, it's hard because, you know, everybody has that capitalistic mentality of like, you know, I want to be the only one to do this. And, you know, um, and I, I think it hurts a lot of us because it's like, you know, and I was kind of that way too. Like, oh, well, you know, everybody should come to me, right? Because I was right. on the Martha Stewart show. <laughs> but, you know, now it's just like, I, if people always email me and they, they want to come take classes because they see my work and it really shows, you know, um, the example of what is possible. Mm -hmm. But I think it's also, you need to focus on helping other instructors out. Like, I'm not the only instructor in the U.S., you know, or in the world, right. you know, so like, I get people from all over the world that say, oh, I really want to take classes with you. Is it possible? My first response is like, there's, you know, instructor A, B, and C, they're, you know, great instructors and they've been in it a long time. And I was like, you're more, you know, it's cheaper if right. you go there, right? Because it's proximity to where they live. But, right. you know, I, I do offer accelerated classes for people that, you know, come from far distances and they, you know, don't have like the luxury of spending, you know, months or here at a time. So, um, you know, if they're willing to do the investment and they want to do it, you know, I can't prevent them from doing it, but I always try to encourage them to go to other instructors as well. So, you know, that's in that sense, like I try to build that community of like, sure. So how did you get on the Martha Stewart show? show? Um, so back in 2017, like we had just moved back from Hawaii to uh, the Bay Area mm -hmm. and we had a friend that, um, we went over to her house and she had a friend that came over and she's like, oh, have you ever heard of Etsy? And I was like, no. And so she's like, oh, you got to be on it. You know, like I sell my rubber stamp cards on there. And I was like, so I just thought it was a place where you sell cards. Mm -hmm. And so... I finally looked into it, you know, I realized the startup costs were cheap because it was like by the listing, right? Mm -hmm. and you're, not, you're not paying a monthly fee, you just pay by transactions. And, right. um, and so I started putting things up there, like two months, I was like, I didn't get anything. Uh -huh. <laughs> and um, so I was just like, oh, well, you know, like, I'll just keep working at it. And then I think it was back in March, we were on our way to Disneyland. Uh -huh. vacation and of course <laughs> <laughs> I got a call as we're driving um and you know my son at the time was two and a half three and uh -huh. you know making a bunch of noise and so I didn't accept the call because I didn't recognize the number and so I picked it you know I listened to the voicemail and they said this is the, this is the producers from the Mark Stewart show we're very interested in what you do you know if, if it works out we may have you on the show please call us back and I'm thinking to myself is this a joke like <laughs> right <laughs> and um so we ended up like I called back and she was like oh you know we had the CEO at the time of Etsy on our show and we're like kind of working with them um to bring on some well you know artists um that do interesting things that would be appropriate for the show and so she said you know there's no guarantees um but you know could you get us uh, samples of your work on our desk by Monday morning and we're on our way to <laughs> Disneyland <laughs> and so I was like okay we'll figure it out like you know and so I managed to get back and you know get in on their desk on Monday and then they called back you know after they had all their meetings with 
Martha Stewart and the whole team, and they said we would love to have you on the show. So then it ended up being like the April first, like April Fool's Day show, and so because uh-huh. you know, it's like good or bad, real, right? <laughs> <laughs> it looks real, but it's not real kind of thing, right? Um, but it was a great experience. You know, it's the first time I'd ever been on national TV, like and live, so, you know. Um, but it was a great process, you know, learning about um, the whole production side and and whatnot. So mm-hmm. um, a little terrifying, but uh-huh. so. But the exposure was good for you. So, like you said, you received orders and calls and inquiries mm-hmm. after exactly. the show. Yeah, it was you huge. Were, mm-hmm. So, what yeah. would your advice be for someone who's in that position that had never been in that position before? Um, it has no. a physical product like yours that's handmade. Right. I mean, a lot of people ask me, what'd you do? And I was like, I got picked. Like, you know, they had a team, uh, their marketing team in Etsy, like, okay, you guys go out and look for something unique, you know, that mm-hmm. would be appropriate for her show. So, you know, I always say, because people are like, do you search out these opportunities? And I'm like, I don't search out opportunities. Mm-hmm. People come to me, like, you know, it's just out of the blue. Mm-hmm. So any exposure that I've gotten, whether it's magazines or, you know, like, TV or whatever, it's because people found me and, you know, they found my, what I do unique. So, mm-hmm. um, and so, uh, yeah, I think it's, if you get the opportunity, go for it. You know, even you know, like, you kind of put your fears aside and you just do it. Like, you know, mm-hmm. it's that adrenaline. <laughs> of course. I was nervous. I mean, like my heart was pounding and, so. I'm sure. And how did you deal with the demand afterwards? Did you have, did you bring on help or did you have any students that were able to help you create the products or did no, you No, it was yourself? all on my own. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I've always, at one point um, when I was getting really busy and I was managing not only the clay side of things, um, so I was doing a lot of weddings. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a great alternative, obviously for fresh flower bouquets and you get to keep it. So that's kind of where the majority of my business was at the time and so you and I met in the wedding industry yes exactly so um what I did was it's one of those things you know it's like everybody's like well why don't you hire somebody to help you and Mm -hmm. it's such a a unique art Mm -hmm. that it takes a lot of time to get good at it you know you're practicing all the time so it's not like you could say oh just make this right like you have to train somebody and you want them to make it the way you you know are making it because it's your name right so so I've never had really somebody to do work for me I did hire my aunt at the time um Mm -hmm. when I was like busy with the invitation side so I was doing the printing and all that design work for that but I also was doing the clay flowers so she would help me you know, and I would pay her, like, you know, a decent wage to, like, you know, make stems or, like, mm-hmm. you know, can you paint this or, you know, cut paper. Uh-huh. So, but that was my only real um, employee at the time. Um, mm-hmm. And so, and then when we moved to New Jersey, um, well, actually, Southern California and New Jersey, I didn't have that person there that I could trust, you know, to mm-hmm. just say, you know, and you help me. And mm-hmm. So it's hard because, you know, like my husband says, like, I could sell your stuff in Highline Hotels and, and all this stuff, but he's like, you can't keep up with the demand. I'm like, you don't have anybody. And so, like, I have, like, over the last year with my student base that I have, you know, they're really motivated. They love um, the art. So, you know, like, I would always encourage them, like, hey, I have an opportunity to teach at an artist guild and it's like more people than I feel comfortable teaching and giving them the adequate um, amount of attention you know why you said you were interested in possibly teaching one day so why don't you you know are you interested in coming with me and practicing teaching so I do that um, from time to time if the opportunity arises and Mm -hmm. and so I think it helps them to like feel comfortable so that by the time they decide okay I'm ready to teach on my own and stuff that they have that experience and, you know, level of comfort. Um, Mm -hmm. And so they learn a lot that way, I think. Um, So that's Mm -hmm. kind of, you know, Mm -hmm. but right now, like I don't do a lot of weddings. Um, Mm -hmm. It's kind of transitioned more to home decor. Like people are looking for pieces to decorate their homes. So why aren't you doing weddings anymore? Is it just not where your passion lies or has the demand changed? I think it's, a culmination of different things. So I think it's 
A, there's more people um, doing the clay art form mm -hmm. um, and they're pricing their products way cheaper. Mm -hmm. For me, I've had, you know, now almost, what, 19 years of experience with this. And so I know the amount of hours it takes to make things and, you know, like, and the techniques are developing to the point where they're more advanced and, and to get that realistic look. Mm -hmm. And so um, I kind of not willing to settle on this price. Like, I will work with clients, like if they have a budget, I'll say, well, okay, you can't get this, but you could get something like this or, you know, so I try to work with them. But I think there's so many more people out there now that are doing it and they're pricing it cheap enough where people are like, oh, yeah, I'll take it. Right. Um, but I've kind of, we're, I'm at the point where, like, I don't want to use fake fillers in the sense of, like, stuff you buy at the store to just kind of add greenery to the arrangement, which I used to do quite a bit early on and that helps because you're not manually having to create sure. flowers but I think it's the issue becomes like well you know if you're selling your art you really want to showcase the full potential of it right. and so with the academy they've really focused this last two years like creating things everything is out of play like you know, the leaves the berries you know and so um, I enjoy that process and I think I find where's my time best suited if people are willing to pay what i would want to charge for mm -hmm. things then i'll make it obviously um but i find my time's better spent trying to teach people mm -hmm. um and give them the opportunity to see where you know they could take it themselves so because mm -hmm. um, a lot of people say oh like that's really cool but i could make it myself right so sure um and that's kind of like the trend, right? right? Well, like photography. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Everyone's a photographer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Everybody tells me, I'm like, oh, you take such great photos. And I was like, that's because the people, you know, I'm not taking pictures of people. It's like, right. a, a, you know, it's a film thing. So, but yeah. Right. So I know you moved from the Bay Area to Southern California to New Jersey. Did oh. you feel like you were starting business all over again with every move? Yeah, you know, it's one of those things. I love the fact that I could take this anywhere. Um, mm -hmm. So in that respect, you know, it doesn't matter where I am. Mm -hmm. um, there's always going to be a market for it. You know, mm -hmm. whether, obviously it's going to be dictated by the economy and what people have to, you know, the extra money you have to spend because this is a luxury for them. Sure. Um, and so it in Southern California, it was hard because the location I was at. Um, we were kind of like in Inland Empire, which is like 90 minutes from LA, 60 minutes from San Diego. So, you know, it's with all the traffic, people don't want to commute. Mm -hmm. So I had a, you know, most of the people that I taught were not local. They came from the other areas and then they took classes. Um, but my business kind of took a step back then, uh, but we were dealing with a lot of stuff, you know, personally and with family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it was more of a transition time. And so when my husband said, you know, I really want to move back to New Jersey um, for his own reasons, um, so we picked up and moved. And he's like, you know, this is great because, you know, like New Jersey, Pennsylvania, New York, like you're right in there and, and the tri-state area and, and, you know, your, your business is going to explode. But we chose to live in Ocean County on the shore. So, you know, again, that comes with some issues because, you know, A, in the summer, nobody wants to come because of the traffic. Right? Uh -huh. um, and so a lot of my students don't come during the summer months or, you know, they try to find other days when it works for them that there's not a lot of traffic. Um, you know, distance-wise, some people find it's too far. So, you know, again, it's just like if their passion is there and they really want to learn. I mean, I have people come two hours to drive, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. to take classes. So I try to work with them. I always tell them, you know, hey, um, since you're coming from two hours away, why don't we do a back-to-back -back class? So at least they're getting the maximum amount of time. And, um, sure. For their, so have you ever considered creating events around classes so that you can bring people in from other areas on specific days and specific locations? Um, I have not. Like I've tried, like I did um, some craft fairs and things. Mm -hmm. So I did one that's like a jury show and, and that usually is always good every year and it's a low, you know, entrance fee mm -hmm. and it supports a great cause in New Jersey. So, um, so I do that one annually. Um, and then I tried like a local, um, art show in, uh, 
Sukai Park because all my friends that you know live here, they're like, oh, you got to do that one because you know, people come with money and it's the last show for lab you know, it's the last weekend, which is Labor Day. And um, it just wasn't the market for me. You know, people are looking for things to decorate, like you know, their shore homes for or to take back. Right. Like, oh, my time, in, you know, at Sukai right. Park. So. Um, I think it was just too upscale and too new to mm -hmm. most people. Mm -hmm. um, and so that didn't work out. So I didn't see those shows again. Mm -hmm. And then I try to work through artist guilds, like mm -hmm. garden clubs are kind of big here. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I've got an interest there. Um, mm -hmm. But what I find is like, because of the way the academy is structured and you know, you're trying to find students um, to sign up for the, with the curriculums, you know, when you go to an artist guild, all those people are usually trying to keep the guild going, right? So they're always right. just going to focus on taking classes there, and which is fine, you know, like I totally understand it. And it was a great opportunity to just expose people to a new art form and they really enjoyed it. Um, and so it's not a great space for me in terms of like if I'm trying to build more mm -hmm. student base, um, right. but if like I'm just trying to show like a workshop, like a one-off kind of deal, mm -hmm. then it, it works great. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah. And have you ever considered hosting your own, maybe a retreat for students? So the only thing that I really did um, this past summer was um, Yukiko came, she agreed to come from Hawaii and it's a lot for her because she's traveling so much and she's teaching, you know, internationally. And so we had talked about it and she was like, oh, well, can you come to Hawaii? And I said, no, like, and I already announced to people that, and my students that, hey, she's coming and you know, and to them, it's like, she's a celebrity, right? So, sure. like, um, so she's like, okay, I'll come. And so I was really worried because, like, it's open only to, like, members and instructors. So, uh -huh. um, you know, I had to maintain, like, I had to have a certain level of people coming uh, for her to, you know, want to do this. Sure. And so um, it all worked out, like, um, where we live, we have a clubhouse on the other side. You know, I was looking to either rent a space or whatever because our house is too small for it but um we ended up uh, renting a clubhouse on the other side of our island and um, it worked out great like we had i think 11 or 12 people uh -huh. and um you know everybody enjoyed themselves it was a lot of work like people don't understand what accelerated means until they actually take a class and they're like wow right. <laughs> um you know and for me like i've done this 19 years now and like we did a three-day workshop in my home for the instructors uh, to learn a new curriculum and I was exhausted I mean granted I was entertaining people we were cooking dinners and, and all that but you know everybody said I really had a great time and you know I learned so much and it was a great opportunity and they realized how much work goes into it you know I could have said like okay well I'll drop you off at the hotel right. you know but we're kind of those people that like, oh, you're here from far away. Like who likes to eat out all the time when they're traveling, right? So, right. So we would cook for some of the people that came from out of state. Right. It's part um, of the entire experience. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, it's, it's one of those things like I, um, somebody was interested in like a garden club, like they have a garden club and, oh, would you be willing to teach like 30 people? And so I was like, yeah, you know, like, um, we'll figure something out, like, you know, in terms of a project that, you know, and so, you know, those opportunities come about, like I had, and then that was through a friend um, who's also an artist and she lives in Pennington and she belongs to a organization called Homefront that helps um, people that are in need. And so I did a, um, an art show, or not an art show, but a holiday craft fair. And so this woman was selling her jewelry and had talked to my friend and she's like, oh, you know, I really would love to take class or you know, could she do like something for our garden club? Because I think the garden club would really love it. And so she had contacted me. And granted, this is like probably fall of next year or whatever. Uh -huh. But um, so those opportunities come. And so like, you know, I definitely entertain those. Um, you know, at that degree, like 30 people is a lot. Sure. So, you know, I would probably like have some of my student instructors come and like, help just so that it, you know, everybody feels like they've got mm -hmm. the attention they deserve. Mm -hmm. so. And how do your local students find you now? Um, a lot of them are through the cake uh, decorating business. So a lot okay. of them, like it's an alternative to like sugar flowers. Uh -huh. um, and so that's the majority of like, I would say like my students, um, uh -huh. they really, um, 
some of them like say it's so different um others say like you know they love it because it's they can do it ahead of time and not have to worry about things breaking and mm -hmm. the sugar flowers are very fragile mm -hmm. um and so it's given them another medium to work mm -hmm. with and mm -hmm. um they really enjoy it and some of like you know they'll do cake classes for certain reasons but they've like basically done away with like you know they don't do the cake business they just do play and stuff. Hmm. it's kind of interesting you know it's um you have different thoughts on it you know and i know with like everything now it's like everybody has a tutorial online or you know like i think craftsy became very popular at one point with mm -hmm. the sugar artists and sewing and everything because everybody wants to be able to do it themselves mm -hmm. um but i find like hands-on like you can, there's that technique and that just expertise that you don't get when you're like looking at a video like you don't know how thin to make it you know or how thin or thick and um just those nuances like i don't think you can get that from an online tutorial mm -hmm. um and so and this is really it is an art like to learn mm -hmm. it to really get good at it and i think you, you know, to me like i'm one of those hands on people like okay show me how to do it sure sure so i'm curious about the cake designers so these are people that you met that had ordered cake flowers from you and then no they um for some reason one way or another like they find me through facebook or instagram okay. and they're looking for um i don't even, you know a lot of people have told me they found me through social media uh -huh. Um, and, and so they're cake designers themselves, yeah. Big? Most uh -huh. of them do it kind of like the side business for them, I see. And so, a lot of them like actually contacted me when I was living in California, and they're like, mm -hmm. Oh, I would love to take class. And I'm like, Well, I live in California, <laughs> so they were all so oh. excited when like they found out I moved to New Jersey. It's like, I'm uh, coming. <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> like, I have this one woman, she wasn't a cake designer, um, but uh, she had been doing deco like flowers for her daughter's wedding her son's wedding and there were no uh instructors in new jersey huh. so she, this was like 10 15 years ago so you know she just learned on her own she bought the books and you know the clay and the materials and just you know she did so for her you know without having any classes and just learning by the book you know she did a great job and so she was so happy like when i moved to new jersey and you know and only a half hour away so right what a coincidence yeah and so you know it was like her life dream right so um right and, so it means a lot to her and she just enjoys it and, right and, so, and how okay. are you finding your cake clients now are you, and you're still making the finished products for cakes um i'm not really doing cakes now like um a lot of like i still get orders through etsy like some people mm -hmm. are you know i think the thing is is like certain times of the year flowers aren't available mm -hmm. so like that's when I come into play, like people find me. Mm -hmm. um, like I have this one person um, that just ordered um, hibiscus flowers. They live in Florida, but you know, they're very fragile, so they're not gonna last in the wedding bouquet. And so they contacted me and asked me, could we have you make the hibiscus flowers and incorporate it into her fresh flower bouquet? I'm like, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. You know, there's some things I have to do to kind of prepare it because it's an air drive clay that's susceptible to water. Mm. So, um, you know, I have to kind of put varnish or something to protect it from the moisture. And um, so she said, oh, we just met with the second forest. And I don't know the reason why, but she's like, he's raving about you. He loves your work. And, you know, so she's like, you know, send me your extra business cards when you send our order down. And she's like, because, you know, you never know, like, it might turn into something for you. So that was really nice. Like, you know, I get a lot of referral business from past clients or current clients, you know, that are happy with the work. So, um, and, you know, I always appreciate that because it's, you know, my work speaks for my itself. And, you know, yeah, absolutely. So I know you mentioned that you do get a lot of your inquiries from Facebook. Can you tell me about your social media strategy? Uh, <laughs> strategy? Um, I try to post as much as I can, um, okay. but, I found that sometimes, you know, like you can post too much. Like I look back okay. at my personal Facebook when, you know, it first came out and like you post everything about yourself, right? Like the most mundane things. Right. And so over the years, I'm like, really do people actually care about that? So I really kind of pared down what I post. I try to always post like when my students come, 
and take classes, their finished products, um, like, which I didn't do before. Uh-huh. Um, but now I feel like, well, if I'm promoting the classes, people should be able to see what other people, you know, my students are doing. Sure. And hopefully it inspires them to want to try the class. Mm-hmm. So, um, so I focus on that. Anytime I'm working on a new project, like I'll kind of post like, uh, work in progress photos and then the finished piece. And, mm-hmm. um, so like I really just use Facebook and uh, Instagram. Um, okay. You know, people ask me, oh, do you Snapchat? And, and it's just so much, you know, you can get so inundated with um, all the social media outlets that it just, you know, it takes you away from the actual work that you need to be doing. Um, mm-hmm. And so and I think some, like my Facebook and my t- uh, Instagram are like fed into my Twitter. So you know, just I, automatically posting. Yeah. Okay. So I don't even look at Twitter. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I just focus on that. Um, like anytime, like something comes up, you know, like, um, in terms of an event or something like I'll post. Mm-hmm. And are you using your Facebook feed? Are you using stories? Are you using Facebook lives? So mostly just the Facebook post. Um, I'm trying a little bit more this year to really focus on um doing more stories Mm -hmm. like i'm you know it's funny we talked about before like you know we're in this um space of like okay i learned marketing but that was before social media right Right. so it's like i kind of feel like my parents when you know like they're (laughs) learning new technology i'm like what the heck am i doing (laughs) is that an awful feeling (laughs) yeah i'm like am i that dumb When you have to ask your kid how to turn the TV on, yeah. you know you're old. <laughs> my son has to tell me to turn the TV on. Right. Like, oh my God. But um, my, I think my biggest fear is like doing um, either Facebook lives or Instagram stories and, you know, where you're actually in front of the camera talking. But I think I have to focus that, like that'll be my big thing for this year is uh-huh. to really focus on getting in front of the camera. So people not like get an understanding for who I am and Mm -hmm. you know like just they can see my art but they don't really know me as the artist um, or the instructor so um, I am making it a point to like work focus on that this year okay in hopes that you know I think people tend to look at the stories more than they scroll you know through their you know all the people who follow on Instagram so Facebook is giving stories more weight than it's giving your feed right now. So it's definitely right. to your advantage to post in a story versus on the feed. Although I think it's better to post in both places because you'll have some people that look at your story that don't see your feed and right. vice versa. So it's easy then, to reuse that content exactly. in different places. Because after like what, 24, 48 hours, it's gone, right? So. Right, right. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And do you have a Facebook group for your students? I don't. You know, we've been talking with some of my students who are instructors now, you know, like, oh, we should develop a group. And, you know, so um, we had talked about it for, like, um, for Deco Clay Craft Academy, having, like, a clay group. And so, you know, there's issues with that because of who's going to administrate it, you know. Mm-hmm. Um And there's just not enough people to like really, um, in terms of manage things, it's a very small, um, group in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, you know, obviously there's a lot of people in Japan and Russia, but, um, so it's just managing their time, right. Because they've got responsibilities and stuff. So, um, so we're constantly talking. Um, I feel like now more than ever, like you could go and her team or, focused on helping um me not just me but instructors who are wanting to grow definitely uh, play in the mm-hmm. and so you know she's always open to ideas and you know it's just hard because like you only have so much time in the day her mom's getting older you know so she's really having to step up in terms of responsibilities in Japan um, and to continue growing you know the art form so um but I feel like I think as time progresses, if we have a plan in action, then I think it'll really um, help mm-hmm. to um, expand. Because you know, um, mm-hmm. a lot of people don't know about this art form. So. A lot of people know about like all, um, female clay and things like that. But you know, obviously they have a bigger platform because this clay is not available like um, 
in Michaels or Hobby Lobby or, you know, the main um, clay stores. Um, so, or craft stores. So it's hard, you know, like how do you get your hands on it? Right. So, mm-hmm. um, and so, and that comes with challenges as well. So, you know, we feel that if you just have the clay on the shelf, you have to have a, a marketing vehicle to get people to buy it. Right. So they don't know how to use it. It's just going to sit on the shelf. Um, and so that's kind of always been our struggle is how do we, you know, get big enough where we can do that. Right. So, and you know, a lot of people, this is a hobby to them. It's not mm-hmm. a business. Mm-hmm. They just enjoy it. And, you know, it brings, um, it's something that they get to do that they like. So they're not willing to go out into those stores and be like, Oh, I'll do a demo. You know, and it's hard, you know, it's like, if you're not an out extrovert and like to talk to people, it's, it's tough, you know, but I started like that. Like, you know, when I was living in Hawaii at the time, she was like, Oh, you know, you should really start to practice teaching. So why don't you come with me when I'm teaching at this um, craft store? And so that's kind of how I started, you know, and it just kept building and building. And I didn't think I could teach because she was teaching like seven people as I'm teaching one person. I was like, (laughs) how do you do that? Like, (laughs) you know, but over the years, obviously it's become like, um, you know, second nature. and, And really I think people see if you enjoy it, you know, then, it shows and then, you know, they're going to enjoy it, you know, and, um, you know, you do have those people that want to take advantage of the situation and, you know, oh, I want to do it this way. And a lot of people have been removed from the academy because, of, you know, um, I mean, I was removed in that mm-hmm. sense um, when I um, had taken a step back and, and did some things that I shouldn't have. And, um, but, you know, they are, they're trying to make an even playing field for everybody. Like there's enough market for everybody. So, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's kind of where, where I'm at. So I lost you for a second there. Sorry. My computer wanted to update software in the middle of our conversation. (laughs) So if my face was looking confused, (laughs) that's what was going on. (laughs) Um, So where do you see your business 10 years from now? Gosh, I would love to, you know, my goal was like when we moved to New Jersey, I could see a Deco Clay Craft Academy East Coast, uh-huh. right? Oh, okay. Um, and, you know, it's hard as you get older, you know, I always tell my instructor, I was like, is it just me or am I getting old and like, I just don't do things as fast or is it because like our techniques are just so intense and time consuming and, you know, so it's um, like, I find, I don't know, like, you know, when you have kids too, like you're balancing everything, right? As they get older, there's more activities and and doesn't get any easier when they're older. (laughs) And I'm one of those people that I have to do work when it's light out. So if it's dark and I have to use like artificial lighting, I don't feel it's, it's, it's harder for me. Like I, Mm -hmm. I work better just when it's daylight. So, um, and so winter months is not as good. But, right. Um, well, a lot of entrepreneurs and creatives suffer from seasonal affectation. So it's yeah. a real concern. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, um, but in 10, you know, I would love to see it grow. Like my goal was, you know, we're in this transition of maybe possibly moving to Florida. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, but I have all these students here that they're like, you're going to leave us? You know, they're so upset. And I was like, I go, I promise you, I said, I will come back or you can come and stay with me and, right. you know, take classes. Um, but my goal was like, you know, my son's a freshman in high school. Um, so, you know, he's older now or maybe when he goes off to college, like I could travel more to teach mm-hmm. because a lot of people can't get to me. Right. And so that's um, my goal um, is, like when that time comes, like be able to go and, you know, work with you to go and, you know, we have enough student base or people interested like that we could team teach and, um, and hopefully grow, um, you know, the market more. So. Mm-hmm. so do you want to teach people that are looking to do it as a hobby or are you looking to teach people that want to be instructors or a combination? A combination. Cause you know, initially people don't have any clue that they want to teach. Like most people like that come to me, I don't want to teach. Like I can't do this. Like, mm-hmm. you know, and, and still to this day, like I have instructors that are certified to teach, but they don't teach. So, mm-hmm. and most people, I always tell them, well, 
get your certification because then you get the better discount on the materials, right? And so even if they only just do finished products, at least they're getting, you know, they're saving more money so that they can, you know, price it and make money on when they sell um, the finished product. So, um, but yeah, it's a combination. And the clay comes from Hawaii? Do you have to order it from the academy? Yeah, so it's from, uh, it's directly from Japan. So, you know, we've been talking about like, oh, well, maybe at some point you can become a distributor. Mm-hmm. So then, you know, I'm not paying mm-hmm. shipping twice, like for mm-hmm. me to order direct from Japan. So, you know, if I told them if the market dictates where like there's so much volume that, you know, yeah, it makes sense for me to become a distributor in, in, in a warehouse to inventory, mm-hmm. I'll do it. But like I go right now, you know, like I have enough to support my students um, and small orders but mm-hmm. you, know, you know like financially it doesn't make sense to me until you know, sure there's demand for it so. sure I know when we had met in California I think at the time were you the only instructor maybe one of two instructors in the U.S. there was a small number of instructors yeah that- so like at the time I was like the well I was the first mainland U.S. instructor so okay. there were instructors in Hawaii and mm-hmm. uh, but not in um, like mainland U.S. Mm-hmm. So. and how many instructors are there now in the U.S.? Um, Mainly. that, that actively teach or that are listed. Um, you know, it's, I think there's two of us that are teaching. Actively. Oh, wow. Um, so it's quite small. Right. Um, but you know, and at one point I think we were maybe up to 20 to 25. So, wow. yeah, but a lot of people don't teach, like they're listed as an instructor. And I think that's what frustrates a lot of people that are looking. I see. Because they're on the website, it says they're an instructor, but they don't actively teach. So they're, you know, going from listing to listing, going, do you teach? Do you teach? And, you know, and then they find out, oh, well, there's only two. <laughs> and where's the other instructor located? Um, she's in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, New York so, um, and then obviously she's also working full time. So she teaches on the side. And then we have one instructor in Georgia, Florida area. Uh-huh. But, um, you know, she's retired, so mm-hmm. you know, they have other things, too. So, mm-hmm. um, so you know, that's my goal, too, is really to develop more instructors and get them excited about teaching and want to teach and, mm-hmm. and um, share it with other people. So. Mm-hmm. so can you tell me about your, your day? I know you said you like to work in the daylight. Are you waking up early to work before your son goes to school and your husband mm-hmm. is up? How do you manage that? Are you usually working during school hours? When yeah, I mean, I, usually teaching wise, like all, um, typically it's weekends. So mm-hmm. like from 9.30 to 1.30, like I do back to back classes. Okay. Um, and then I have one student, she likes to come during the week. So which mm-hmm. works out for me because, mm-hmm. you know, my son's in school. Mm-hmm. And um, so like, I don't have a set schedule. It's kind of dictated by like what my students are up for. So mm-hmm. um, at one point when I taught in the Bay Area, mm-hmm. like I had set days and set times. And so people would sign up that way. But you know, then I had a lot of students um, mm-hmm. come in. Um, but now since it's kind of small, um, okay. like I had five or six students that come regularly. Okay. Um, you know, we kind of just keep it flexible. Um, but as far as my day goes, if I have stuff to work on you know like after my son's gone to school my husband's at work you know I just sit in my studio like we have an open space in our second floor and Mm -hmm. um it overlooks the bay yeah you have a beautiful view (laughs) yeah everybody asks how do you get work done (laughs) well I would think that it would inspire you to do more work yeah you know I love natural sunlight so you know that motivates me I hate it when it's you know dark and dreary but um yeah but yeah, so um, I just, you know, I find that I was spending too much time on social media. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was also taking away time from like actually doing my work. Uh-huh. And so I really tried to focus now on just, you know, making sure I get the work done, you know, um, and then like you know, social media is like at night. And at night and day, so. mm-hmm. um, but it's hard, you know, I think social media is great. Um, it's a great way to get inspired. It's a great way to um, share what you do, but it can also be a negative thing because you start to compare yourself and like, yeah. oh, well, that's cool. I'm like, oh, I should be doing, you know, like you said, it gets in your head and then you just waste time. And so 
and I've been a victim of it. You know, I, you know, my husband always says, are you married to your phone? Like, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's um, hard to disconnect, especially when your business is on your phone. Essentially. Right. That's how you're and, generating your clients. Yeah. So, cause I'm not, you know, like I had listened to one of your other interviews and, you know, like if you're not out there, how are you going to get, you know, like I am not one of those people that hangs out at a coffee shop and like tries to meet people, you know, which is probably bad. Like in terms of like, going out to network with people and person to person, you know, um, and, but like, I just find I don't, I'm not that type of person, you know, like I don't mind working through social media, but, you know, you're kind of protected <laughs> sure. in a sense, but, um, you know, I always, I value the networks that I've, you know, come to know and, and um, people that really support what I do. Like, you know, I've networked with a few realtors that like, oh, these are awesome gifts for clients that just bought yeah. a home. And, and so like, and it's not, not something like I thought of before, right. you know, it was like friends of ours that are realtors that, um, you know, that appreciate what I do. And so they like, oh, I have a client, they're closing. Could you make me something? And usually it's last minute because you never know like when something's going to close. So, right. um, but like all their clients are just amazed and, they, you know, they love the gift. And, you know, it's, yeah nicer and more thoughtful than just like the gift part. Right. So, right. Um, well, I've learned in my business, I know you and I had spoken about this the other day. Um, but in my business, when I moved to the East coast from California, the one and only organization I joined was the chamber of commerce. Right. Um, and I did that initially because, um, a woman in California had, Set, when she she was young, um, I can't remember the name of the, the company. I think it was Satora Cakes. Do you remember that? Uh -huh. So she was young. I think she was 23 years old. And she, she was working for them, and she was able to grow it into a substantially sized business. And so I asked her, how did you do that so quickly? And she said, I joined the Chamber of Commerce. So I thought, all right, I'll give it a try. Right. So, came here to Doylestown, I joined the Chamber of Commerce. It was the only organization I joined. I went to all different types of events and, you know, from business card exchanges to committee meetings until I found the events within the chamber that fit my personality the best. Mm -hmm. And then I started meeting people. I had no idea how I was going to connect with these people or what they would want from me because at the time I was strictly a wedding photographer. Right. So um, I didn't, I couldn't see the possibilities in front of me, but then I started meeting people and they started asking me to do photography, brand identity photography, photography for a bank or photography for a hospital or a retirement community. So it right. grew in ways I never would have expected. Yeah. Um, I find that this, like the artist guild and the smaller art clubs and photo clubs really weren't the right market for me. They weren't yeah. my clients. They weren't the people that could afford my prices. Right. Um, but when I was networking with other professionals, they saw the value in my work and were willing to invest in me and my work as well. So right. I really am proud of that relationship and it's continued to sustain the business throughout these last 10 years. So now I don't have to actively, I still do, but I don't have to actively prospect as much because right. the people just come to me because they know that I'm here and I position myself properly right. in the market. So I'm able um, to bring work in, not just from my immediate location, but also from Philadelphia and Princeton and, and New York as well. Right. So it's amazing how this area in particular, and I'm sure other areas are like this too, but this area in particular is very intertwined. Mm -hmm. um, so those connections that you're making go a long way. Right. I think too, you know, I've never had to search out, I guess, like yeah. for opportunities, they've always just come. Mm -hmm. um, but I think as I'm finding, you know, I'm not getting as much business and I'm like, what am I doing differently? You know? And, um, and I think you just get, com you know, you get comfortable with where you're at and then, you know, when things aren't good, you know, you're like, okay, what do I need to do? And at the time I think, like blogging was such a big thing, right? And so that's that was my space where like I could express myself and you know and 
people follow my blog, but like, I don't think blogs are that popular anymore. As, Some are. Yeah. yeah. You know, it depends if you have that following and, and I stopped blogging and I'm like, do I go back to it? You know? And so I think too, it's like, you have to get over your own fear of like failure to just, you know, try whatever sticks, <laughs> you know, yeah. throw it at the wall. <laughs> That's right. Um, you know, and so it's hard because it's like, we're in this space right now where are we moving? Are we staying? And, um, right. and so it limits me in the sense like, well, do I put myself out there and try to do this with the expectation that we could be moving in right. six months? Um, and so like, I'm kind of in limbo and I, you know, like, so I just continue to do what I do and, right. Um, so, yeah, but, you know, that, I think that's one thing. If I can get to the point where I can travel to teach and it financially makes sense, you know, and it makes um, money that way, then I would do it because like, there's so many people that want to learn, but they just don't have the capability of like, you know, being away and all that. So. Sure, sure. So then you should put yourself out there, you know, yeah, in this exactly. interim. That way you can build your client base up right. in, you know, in the Northeast. So when you're ready to travel, you have the clients yeah, exactly. waiting for you. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time and sharing your story with us. Well, thank you for having me and allowing me to share with everyone. Yeah, absolutely. Um, how can people reach you if they're interested in getting in, uh, teaching, learning with you? So um, I have my website. It's uh, dkdesignshawaii.com. Okay. Um, and then I'm also on Facebook if you look for DK Designs Hawaii. Um, and social media, I think it's, or Instagram, it's just DK Designs. So. Okay, fantastic. I'll be sure to share all of that information in the comments as well. So if anyone is looking to take any classes or buy any finished products, although I know you said you're not doing that as much, um, I'll be sure to share that and put that out there. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, I'll talk to you soon. All right, Bye. sounds good. Bye.